Behind the Leaf discusses cannabis in terms of education, history, culture, policy, and advocacy. It is geared for adults only. If you are not an adult, come back when you are. Welcome to another episode of Behind the Leaf. I'm your host, Stephen, and today we have a very special show in honor of our eighth episode and in honor of Fourth of July right around the corner. For high history, Eddie F. and Diaz takes you on a little visit to the past to check out which one of our forefathers loved him. On today's segment of At the Root of It, I sit down with Joe Rogaway of Rogaway Law Group to find out what led him into advocacy, law, and what cannabis means to him. I sit down with cannabis community member, Tabby G, to find out how cannabis helps her as a patient and a young professional. And then last but not least, I sit down with Easy e Ruthless Records' own Stefan Roachkilla to find out how him and the Seabright Farms team view cannabis. Join me on this episode of Behind the Leaf. Let's go. This is your main homie, Eddie F. And Diaz, along with the LBCA bringing you guys another episode of High History. Let's spark this joint. You can't smoke with us, can't blow it up. Another cherry kush blunt to the coconut. So who's on today's agenda? Well, I figure for 4th of July, let's get a little presidential and talk about one of our forefathers, Mr. George Washington. Tell me how you gonna be rolling with the what did George Washington like? He liked hemp. In fact, he liked hemp, tobacco, and cotton, and really advocated for those three crops, even deciding whether they would be a good cash crop. But ultimately, his crash crop became wheat. But that didn't stop him from growing hemp. God, this is so good. This is really bomb. Hemp is a very important crop for the time that Washington lived in because it was used for so many different things like rope, clothing, sacks, canvas. It can be used for paint. It's oils drawn from the seeds. It's very nutritious. It could be eaten. There were so many different things that came from hemp and Mr. Washington saw all of it. Researchers at the University of Virginia are actively growing hemp at Washington's old farm to understand, interpret how important this crop was to him and to the people at the time. Now, my personal opinion is he saw how much it could do for him and he just grew it because as a grower, Growing hemp is something that is not like anything else. You, you know you're gonna use this and it just feels good. So that's pretty crazy. Originally from the Asia, originally from the Asia, like Asia's a fucking, <laughs> it's a spot on the map, but it's also a continent. Originally from Asia, hemp has found its way up towards Russia, up towards United Kingdom, places, in Europe, going over into the boats along the Americas. I mean, this plant was amazing. I'm getting toasty, man. And if you're a dirty person, hey, hemp seeds can be made into soap. So wash yourself. Washington used hemp for everything. He grew it to fit his needs. He loved hemp so much, he collected different strains, different seeds. And I wonder, 
I wonder, did he ever smoke his own crop? Do I think George Washington smoked? I don't know. I want to say yes, because when I grow my weed, I smoke it. And it's a beautiful plant to grow, it's fun. So no doubt about it. But let me know from you guys. Do you guys think he did grow and smoke his own weed? Put it in the comments section below. Tag us at LBCA on Instagram. All right guys, my name is Eddie and Diaz. This was High History from the LBCA. I hope you guys enjoy this and you have learned something. We'll see you guys next time. And we're out. Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Behind the Leaf. I am your host, Stephen Contreras, and today on our community segment, I am here with cannabis community member, Tabby Grutube, who is a young cannabis activist as well as young professional and someone who I feel you need to know. Tabby, thank you for joining us today, and how are you doing? I'm doing very well, Stephen. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure and an honor. Of course, you know, we are all about our community, all about local Long Beach and you are a Long Beach resident. Yes. Um, Tabby, tell everyone who doesn't know a little bit about yourself and how you got into the industry. Okay, perfect. Uh, well, my name is Tabby. A lot of people know me as Tabby G. And I am a cannabis advocate and activist. And I'm currently serving as the sales director for Humboldt Farms. Oh, I wow, do regional okay. direction with them. And um, I got into the industry because, well, I started consuming cannabis when I was fairly young. Okay. It helped me with a lot of health issues and even social issues. I can um, imagine. And that also got me into a more alternative lifestyle. And I started working for a tattooed modeling agency that then purchased a farm. And uh, that farm then became Lowell Farms. Oh, okay. Uh, who, very, yeah, very popular brand. Very okay. popular brand. I worked with them for two and a half years and then had the opportunity to join Humboldt and that's where I'm at right now. Very nice, okay. So definitely you've been around in the industry and in the legal market for a while, correct? Yes, I started solidly in the legal market. Um, while I lived in, the, in Mexico City, there was no legal market. So <laughs> <laughs> my professional background before is Non-disclosed. I'd, I'd say, you know, traditional market, we could say, <laughs> you know, just sliding under there. So cannabis, I would imagine, is part of your entire lifestyle since it's been, it it's been rooted since you were so young. Um, what does cannabis as a plant mean to you? Um, well, that's a very special question, Stephen. Cannabis for me means a lot of things. I would say one of the most important ones would be love and connection. Mm -hmm. um, cannabis has helped me just connect with myself and with other individuals at a deeper level. Um, cannabis means also my economical stability because that's my job and I've developed all my career around it. Mm -hmm. And it also means change and it means medicine and it means healing, which yes. is a super important part. So right now in the current climate of the world, how does it feel from a plant you love to be once demonized and still to a point demonized, but now the entire industry and the workforce is essential? What does that feel like? <laughs> well, for me, it's been an intricate process, you know, because when I was introduced to cannabis, it was highly illegal and it was mm -hmm. totally demonized, but also in my culture accepted as a medicine. So it depended, it, it kind of depends on how you're looking at it. And then coming here, being introduced to the legal industry, it was, you know, accepted, but it wasn't socially um, considered essential. Like no yes, one would have imagined Never. <laughs> that in a million years, cannabis workers or employees would be considered essential workers mm -hmm. and uh, would even be able to operate with normality, you know, following yeah. guidance and precautions Safety, yeah. within a pandemic or a social situation like the one we're living. Mm -hmm. um, so it's super tricky because even personally, my parents at the beginning, they were like, are you sure? 
you don't want to go to college and just pursue a cannabis <laughs> career and um, well live in LA and you think that's going to be the drill I don't think they imagined that it was going to get serious or that the companies that I was going to be a part of were going to take off and be successful and respect it within the industry so it's 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 interesting to me I find it really peculiar <laughs> that now we're considered essential it's it's a milestone it's a it historic is. milestone very historic and now people finally accept that it's here to stay and that it's not only accepted but essential which is redundant but crazy to say. we're hitting a point here essential yeah. <laughs> we are essential and now you know federal government needs to get on that same plane so for the community what is your preferred delivery method well i like smoking okay <laughs> okay smoking is my preferred delivery method um which kind do you like smoking out of a bong are you a joint are you a blunt i love joints okay and i love blunts okay and I which one like do you like more I like both. I wouldn't be able to choose. You can't judge. <laughs> I wouldn't be able to choose. Smoke both at the same time? I do think that I need to smoke to answer this question. Be my <laughs> guest, please. So I'm going to light up this blunt <laughs> right now. So what's your favorite thing about smoking? Um, honestly, the taste. I enjoy even the smoke, just visually for me, it's, it's beautiful. Um, and just the experience, you know, mm -hmm. generally when I smoke, I smoke with other people, so I share. Okay. And sharing and being it able to It brings a sense connect. of community, yes. yes. You become, you bond mm -hmm. over it. It's a, uh, I'm glad that more people feel that way. That that's a general, that's a general theme within the cannabis community is that, you know, smoking with someone creates creates a bond and breaks exactly. barriers and, and is super unique and at a different level. And that sounds, I'm not trying to get too deep with it, but <laughs> like it, it's cool because I definitely feel that way. We were talking to Roach Killa earlier and he was definitely feeling that way as well. So, you know, I like it. What is your favorite strain or some of your, your top favorite? I am a pothead geek. <laughs> okay. A terpene lover. I love terpenes. Um, so I don't know, it would have to be the fruity ones. I okay. really like fruity flavors. One of my favorites or probably all time favorite is forbidden fruit. Um. But lately I've been just enjoying a lot of Jack Herrera's, a lot of blue dreams, a okay. lot of, I got into old school strains more recently. Um, and why, just, why is that? Just because I appreciate like genuine genetic profiles and strong terpene profiles and you know more often than not the old school strains have really strong terpene profiles so so what matters more terpene profile or percentage Ooh, that's a great question and i'm glad i'm really <laughs> glad you asked because it's a stigma that i've been trying to break along with I've, i'm pretty sure all my colleagues in the cannabis industry um thc percentage doesn't matter it only matters to a certain point because your body can only observe a certain amount of THC and every body's endocannabinoid system is different. And just a little background on endocannabinoid systems, um, as human beings and a lot of other living creatures have it as well, we have receptors in our brain that solidly react to cannabinoids, mm -hmm. which is very interesting because it kind of, well, it says pretty much that we are biologically engineered and designed to process cannabis. Mm -hmm. Fights with cannabinoids, absolutely. Yes, um, so the interesting thing about this is that terpenes will react differently with mm -hmm. everybody and that's why cannabis is a plant that you need to get to know. Okay. <laughs> so here, I shall, I'll share Thank this with you. you. But I believe that for me, like fruity tastes just kind of like race the endorphin and serotonin levels in my brain, which makes me happier. I really enjoy it. Like the taste just makes me immediately enhanced. If it okay. makes any sense. No, definitely. You, you gain that euphoric feeling from that terpene profile. And essentially that's what you have to chase to achieve yes. that high that you want to experience pain relief. <laughs> so looking at the cannabis community, where is somewhere that you wish 
the cannabis community would go towards. We just touched on terpenes and understanding that in THC. Where else would you like to see some change? Well, I would call it area of opportunity okay. and uh, I'd say sustainability 100%. Hmm. I think that's the next step for the industry and the world in general. Super important and something that just really resonates with me and as a professional I've only repped sustainable brands and that's how I want to continue. I would only represent the brand that's mindful about the environment, community and just overall kindness towards mm -hmm. the world and social responsibility. So yeah, sustainability 100%. Okay, that's, that's a huge concern right now and a huge topic and I am seeing more and more brands take efforts towards sustainability but it's definitely going to be a big concern come 2021 and the future. And I'm glad that you start the conversation now because we are, what, three years into the legal market, a little bit more than that, but essentially here in Long Beach. If we don't start this conversation now in 10 years, in five years, it's going to be too late. So sustainability is a big concern and hopefully you pay attention. I agree. And you know, as a part of the community and cannabis community and industry, I don't want to see a lot of cannabis waste end up in landfills. I don't want to be held responsible for damage occurring to the planet or society. Mm -hmm. So I would urge everybody who's a part of the industry or the community to feel the same way just because there will be, as you say, a point where there is no going back. Yeah. And we have now the opportunity to raise awareness and just choose um, brands and organizations that are mindful yes. and respectful towards the environment and just the overall social. That's a whole nother topic. <laughs> should we should we hold brands uh, accountable to sustainable efforts? That's, I, that's I a huge another topic. You know, I think we should. I think we should hold every human accountable for sustainable efforts. Very true. And sustainable efforts, you can volunteer at the LBCA beach cleanup that once COVID is over, we'll get back to. Um, you've participated in a few of the beach cleanups yes. and you see how much cannabis waste there is and you know, yes. each person makes a difference. And you've, yes. if you haven't seen the beach, Alamitos Beach in a while, um, it's looking bad. A few people have gone out there. I've been out there, me and my family, to pick up some trash. And uh, you know, we're excited to get back to it. It was concerning to see the amount of cannabis waste that ended up in the coast. Mm -hmm. um, we picked up a lot of canisters. We picked up a lot of joint containers. Yeah. And now we're starting to see a lot of face masks and a lot of just protective wear, yeah, which PP. is, you know, very needed in the current pandemic that we're in, but it can't be um, managed in a wrong way. You know, it needs yeah. to be properly handled and properly disposed. And that's something that I think we need to start talking about. So we create a sustainable culture within the industry. And as a cannabis consumer, as a cannabis parent, as a cannabis professional, you are not held accountable for not being conscious or yeah. aware mm -hmm. of what's going on. Very That's true. part of breaking the stigma and allowing society to appreciate us professionals or consumers and not stigmatize uh, cannabis and tie it with ignorance or mm -hmm. with lack of empathy towards the world, you know? That's a very good point you made. The world should be a little bit more empathetic. I definitely believe that. Is there anything that you would like to let our viewers know or leave them on any last, <laughs> any last, last words? Last words. <laughs> well, just thank you. You know, thank you for thank everything you. that everybody does. I think that it's not often that we take the chance to thank each other. Thank you, Steven. <laughs> thank you, LBCA and everyone working in the team. Thank you, everybody that's a, an essential worker in the cannabis industry. Yeah. All but tenders out, out there everyone. who have been killing it during this time. Everyone who's in the front line and everyone who's even behind the scenes ensuring that everyone stays safe and just looking after us all. Yeah. Just that, yeah. I know, yeah. Let's give, a, let's give a big round of applause to uh, the entire cannabis workforce for adapting and, you know, continuously working through it. Like you said, day in, day out, kicking butt and, you know, proving that we're more than just uh, a bunch of lazy stoners. Yes. Productive stoners. Productive stoners. We smoke weed and organize. 
change from cannabis. <laughs> but um, thank you so much, Tabby. Where can everyone find you? Um, social media, where can they find Humboldt Farms? Everything like that. Well, you can find me on social media. I only use Instagram. Okay. I might not use it forever, but as of right now, you can look me up as Panther Nebula, Panther underscore Nebula. Humble Farms is available at many legal dispensaries throughout the state, and you can find them in different platforms like Weed Maps, or you can find them on Jane, which is an amazing new platform where you can purchase cannabis searching your favorite brands. Um, I would definitely give them a try. It's a sustainable and organically grown naturally in living soil cannabis brand and we have a very best line of cannabis products with high frequency and nice energy so yeah that's well, pretty much it <laughs> well, perfect and as for me you can find everything the lbca at the lbca on all social media platforms and tune in to the next episode thank you again tabby thank you steven we'll see thank you. you guys And hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of At the Root of It. I am your host, Harris, and today I'm with a very special guest, LBCA member Joe Rogaway with Rogaway Law. How are you doing this morning? How's everything? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Good. I work with you very closely, Joe, and I know you are very passionate about everything that you do, but please tell all of our listeners a little bit about you and, and your law firm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so uh, I am an attorney uh, focused on the cannabis industry, um, and I uh, own a law firm that has, um, has a lot of good attorneys in it that um, do really good work in uh, litigation and regulatory compliance and intellectual property um, and employment law and essentially just about everything that one needs in uh, the cannabis industry, um, other than such like patent law and tax stuff. Um, but uh, we do a lot of work in the space, and, and personally, I've been in the cannabis industry in a formal capacity since uh, 2004, uh, when I was a law student at USF. Um, so that I, while I was there, I started working at Americans for Safe Access as a law clerk. I had actually started a chapter of um, Students for Sensible Drug Policy at my law firm, excuse me, at my law school at USF, uh, and um, at a conference is where I met Steph Schur. And she brought me into uh, Americans for Safe Access, which is where I started working on policy. And I started doing some really cool work in 2004 um, at the time when we were converting from the patient caregiver model uh, to the collective cooperative model. So I wrote all the legal guides for Americans for Safe Access um, and did other cool little things like attended um, city council meetings. Like I, I drove up from Oakland to Ukiah and argued um, against a ban on outdoor cultivation for the city of Ukiah because essentially like in downtown Ukiah, everybody had just blown up their yards, like filled them with plants and like the whole town <laughs> reached like weed. And so they're putting more tornado place, which is one of the very first ones. And so we wanted to deal with that from a policy standpoint. Um, and, and just, you know, the, we're qualified patients. We have rights under Prop 215 and some additional stuff under SB 420 you can't say we're not allowed to cultivate. That was like the first entree um, as a policy uh, issue. Um, I ended up working on some other really cool stuff, um, assisted uh, the organization in some litigation against the highway patrol, and I helped coordinate uh, the service or process for the California State Attorney General at my law school, which was like this really cool, fun event. Um, and uh, then we ended up winning that issue, so the CHP recognized SB 420. Um, and then after law school, I went to go work as um, I wanted to stay in the cannabis industry. And in 2005, <clears throat> excuse me, there really was no industry that you could be a part of other than working as an attorney, um, other than working in uh, criminal defense. And so when um, I was, you know, just had passed law school, I took a job working for the Mendocino County Public Defender's Office. Um, and I ended up uh, taking all of their marijuana cases for the entire Public Defender's Office. And so you know, as like a very brand new, fresh, um, young attorney, I ended up really getting to be in the front lines of the war on drugs impacting cannabis in a way that was, I think, fairly unique uh, because there was really nowhere else that had the same volume 
of, of you know, cases of cultivators and people that were transporting and brokering and all of the stuff at the time, and then trying to defend a lot of that conduct under the auspices of, uh, of SB 420 and the collective model under Health and Safety Code Section 11362.775. So I really cut my teeth doing all of that stuff. Um, then uh, I, um, after sort of cycling through the criminal defense world, that really wasn't what my, my main passion was and not why I went to law school. I really wanted to get back to just focusing on cannabis. In 2011, I started my own law firm. Um, and um, as I was transitioning um, through being like a public defender and having my own law firm, I worked on Prop 19. So while I was a public defender, uh, there'd be days actually where I would drive from Mendocino County all the way to UK, sorry, to Oakland to um, work on Prop 19, 19 stuff with Richard Lee. Um, that effort ended up not being successful for, I think, a variety of reasons. But it was my first state level policy issue um, that I was really involved with in terms of a voter initiative. I went on to work on three or four other voter initiatives between then and 2016. Um, and then after legalization, uh, came into being, everything really was, became hyper-focused on the localities. So I worked, you know, um, in different places. I did a lot of stuff in the early days um, in Santa Rosa, which has become a really amazing jurisdiction, very, um, very good regulations in terms of cannabis. Um, more recently, I've been doing some great stuff in Long Beach. And, you know, seeing the progress that LBCA made on the tax issue is, um, was just, just really inspiring and something that, I hope can be replicated everywhere. And uh, so these days I'm working for, um, in terms of policy, primarily on social equity issues and, you know, uh, working between sort of the, these partnerships between like the, the private industry and municipalities um, to find ways to improve the system. While as a law firm, we're doing all of the normal stuff we always do. We always keep like a very strong pro bono practice going. And so we try to dedicate a lot of our time to helping people. So, you know, part of that is helping organizations like LBCA. Um, part of that is helping kids that need access to cannabis and aren't being allowed to go to school. Um, and so there's a lot of cool stuff that we do. And I'm just happy to be here talking to you about it. Well, thank you so much for sharing. I do want to touch on something right now is how can cannabis legalization and social equity help end systemic racism? <laughs> well, it, it can't. I mean, it's, it's, uh, there's a, we can have a small piece of trying to improve the situation, but I think the reality is, is that the, the, the goal, the construct of having um, one sort of preferential treatment through the existing social equity programs, which basically is you give preferential treatment to a particular applicant who can demonstrate they meet certain criteria to be a social equity applicant and what their benefit is is they just get prioritized in a permitting process for the most part. That's what they get. Maybe some minor reduction in fees in some places or some instances, but primarily it's just they get to the front of the line. And the idea that if you just give someone, you know, cuts to the front of a permitting line, that's going to help end systemic racism or even like, let, let's just take the expectation down a little bit, just help other people, you know, just, just like the benefit for anybody in any community at all. I think is, is, is false. You know, that's a false premise. So I think um, what we can do is that we can have a better targeted approach where we implement more thought through policies where what we're actually trying to do is to benefit um, communities rather than benefit applicants. And I think that that is a really strong, a really important difference and an important sort of philosophical difference as we're looking at how we construct these social equity programs. And so, you know, starting at the place that it's absurd to think that anybody's going to be helped really by just giving somebody cuts to the front of a permitting line for one type of permit in a universe that they need millions of dollars to start their business with and a lot of sophistication and a lot of people working around them to help. Um, it's just, it's just a false, false promise of, of opportunity. And what we need to do is to create real promises of opportunity for people and to find ways that we can actually direct revenues to communities that need them. So for example, um, we, through our tax dollars as an industry, we put a lot of that into law enforcement. That is like through the voter initiative, through Prop 64, many, many, many millions of dollars every year goes to law enforcement. So as we're thinking about, you know, all these concepts of like, 
defund the police. Maybe what we can really do is just th- rethink about where cannabis monies go. And instead of cannabis monies going towards policing, we can put it towards things that actually have a more tangible benefit to people like infrastructure, healthcare, education, basic, basic things that we should have dealt with a long time ago in a lot of different ways. Let's work on that now, you know? So I think we can do that. I think that, you know, if we're able to, to find a way to get a dedicated revenue stream um, from cannabis into the communities that need the money for just the, the basic stuff to, to try and like level the playing field, you know, I think that that's a much better sort of goal than to try to have one applicant that gets preferential treatment over another applicant, because inherently it, it um, bottlenecks the whole system. So just look at Los Angeles. It's been a complete debacle, but it's not just Los Angeles. There's all sorts of shenanigans, essentially in every jurisdiction that has this model. So Oakland, San Francisco, you name it, every major metropolitan area has a program like this. And there's always ways that people can gain that system. It's, it's just the, the way that, that those systems are constructed and implemented lends itself to gamesmanship. And so I think we can just reduce that, that issue, uh, that friction point, uh, which became a huge problem in Los Angeles, um, and find a way to just give people opportunity. And so there's a lot of things, for example, that could happen in Long Beach that I think um, are really cool. So, you know, the things that we're working on a lot together is the, uh, the program with Long Beach City College, which I think is just a really amazing opportunity that we have to go into partnership with, with an educational institution in a way that's unique that hasn't really happened anywhere that I'm aware of and have this partnership between the industry com- you know, composed of the, the members of LBCA that are gonna be working on each of these classes and presenting these classes and the school And what we're doing is we're teaching people how to manufacture cannabis products, how to cultivate cannabis, what we're testing for, why we're testing for it, and how we're going to test for it, and um, how uh, the distributors are going to work as the nerve center for the the whole thing, Um, and what the laws are and the regulations that support all that stuff so that when people end up, you know, applying for a job, um, they, they know what they're doing and they have yeah. a, a leg up and there's a way that they can demonstrate to the employer that they have some type of certification that says that they, they are a better applicant than somebody else. And, and that, that type of benefit is something that is tangible because when an employer sees that and they, they understand what it means that somebody went through a course like this, they know that it's going to be a better hire, a better onboarding probably than somebody who did it. And uh, then that the, the proof really comes not in the hiring, but, you know, in the first week that somebody has that job, how are they doing? You know, did they pay attention in class? Do they understand what, what these SOPs are and, and why you have them? Did they listen to any of the legal stuff that I was talking about so they understand why this matters and why they don't want to do things differently? You know, all of that stuff is, um, is so important, but it's, what's cool is that we're doing that with the, with the school, with the city college. And then not just that, but we may be um, conversation with the city of Long Beach, um, who also, you know, is very dedicated to social equity, has d- demonstrated a lot of interest, has obtained grant funding from the state, really positive conversation there. And through all of those things, it's creating real opportunity for people. And that's, and that's what the way that I see uh, um, how we can really try to impact some of these systemic issues. The, the, some of the, the, the biggest problems that we have systemically at the root of it are because we don't have equal access to opportunities. And so the, where somebody ends up in life and the, tra- the trajectory that their life takes and whether they end up on Wall Street um, or in San Quentin in many ways is something that is determined at birth. And it's an issue that is related to zip code and to complexion and to your family name more so than, than you know, who one is and what their attributes are. And, and I think that the more that we can do to get to the root of it, to get to the place where we're going to, to like, what are the root causes of poverty? What are the root causes of lack of opportunity? How can we make it so that all neighborhoods have opportunity because they have access to the really basic things that we all need? 
those are the things that we can, in some small way, address as a cannabis industry. We're, we are not the panacea. We can't solve all of the problems because these problems have always existed. These are problems that were inherent in the founding of our country um, and never got better. Um, not really, and for a lot of people in a lot of different ways. And so we can do what, what we can within sort of the confines of our industry to find benefits, to find opportunity, to find an equalizer so that, you know, we as an industry, kind of to my earlier point, we can, we can showcase a different way of doing things. You know, we can, we, the, the sort of era um, that we may be coming out of that has been so hyper-focused on, you know, um, shareholder uh, dividends um, and uh, corporate profits um, to the detriment of communities, to the detriment of the environment, to the detriment of um, public health. Like all of those things, we may be able to, to transcend that on a larger scale, but as a cannabis industry, I think that we can showcase what we can do and how it can be done. I don't think I could have come up with a better response for that at all. Everything you hit right on right on the head. And um, I agree, we do need to get to the root of it. And thank you for, for clarifying all of that. I really do appreciate it. Yeah, um, happy to. Joe, where, where can people find you in your law firm? Uh, Rogwaylaw.com is, uh, is my website. Um, uh, that's the best place. And then you can get access to um, all of our social media from there. You can get access to... Um, some resources that we have available for people in the cannabis industry. Um, and uh, yeah, happy to talk to anybody uh, that, that is interested after uh, he, seeing this podcast. And if you want to get an opportunity to learn directly from Joe, he is going to be the instructor for the LBCC cannabis curriculum. So make sure you sign up. The LBCA is going to have more info on that. But Joe, thank you so much for your time this morning. And I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you for joining us at the root of it. Likewise. Thank you for having me. We are in our Long Beach Grow facility. It is 22,000 square feet, indoor cultivation, and we provide some of the best indoor cannabis to the California marketplace. That's the rave room. We hold raves at night. <laughs> This room is the first place where we start to blow off all of the contaminants that might be attached to a person's body. So it would be pollen, bugs, any type of dirt, all that kind of stuff, so that we're trying to get as sterile as, as possible before people get into the work area. All the employees come through the air wash. They grab their uniform from the front of the building that's cleaned. This facility is 36 flower rooms, 12 bedrooms, two mother rooms, and 16 dry and cure rooms. So down this corridor here are all of the flower rooms on the left-hand side, all the bedrooms on the right-hand side, as well as the mother room. Each one of our rooms is set up exactly like this. We have three individual rolling bench tables where all of the plants are on top of the table. There's irrigation brought to each of the plants from the back of the room. The water comes from the water room where it's fertilized and nutrients are put in, and then it's brought to each one of these tables. Each of these tables has about 140 on each one of these tables. They're watered three to four times a day. Guys will come in here every day and inspect the plants. They will change the water filters so that the plants continually get water without them getting clogged and then the plant doesn't get water and it dies. The guys are continually coming in and pulling leaves, adjusting the plants up into the nets because as you see they get heavy and they start to fall out. A lot of daily maintenance on leafing, watering, keeping the filters clean, and checking the environment to make sure that the uh, ACs, all the lights are on, all the humidity is working, all the humidification is working properly, the CO2. It's a balancing act to try and make something perfect. This is the pineapple OG, the logo I'm wearing on my hat. This is one of the strains we created eight years ago, and it's throughout a lot of our breeding and lineage of our genetics that we grow in this building. Very proud of this strain. It's a 
you'll see it's a retching strain. It likes to elongate and get tall. And if we go into the next room over, you'll see that the orange sunset is a different strain. It likes to stay stout and bushy. One of the things that Brett and his team have cultivated over the last 20 years is very distinct smells. It smells like I just bit into a fresh orange. Tell them a little bit about this strain. Yeah, so this genetic, like Rick said, it is very unique and distinct. It's very orangey smelling. It tastes like an orange Skittle. The genetics behind it were OGK and OG Kush. they off with orange banana that led to this type of genetic that smells like orange, tastes like orange, a very uplifting, creative type of high when you smoke it. It's one of our finest creations, I believe, to date. Some of the most important things are getting that air to move around in an efficient manner so that it can hit the dehumidifiers, it can get to the AC units, and making sure that we're utilizing all of the capabilities that we have for each individual strain and figuring out exactly how to make things work. We're trying to homogenize the environment to get rid of every microclimate that could exist. experimental rooms. What makes it experimental is the genetics that are in it. This is the Strawberry OZK. This is a brand new breeding project and genetic that we created last year. And it takes that long to bring things to market, I'm testing them, making sure they're stable, make sure that they don't put out seeds, and making sure they give you the desired results. So this is one new strain here. On that side of the room is another new strain. It is, it is called Picasso Kush. It is a, cross of our pink Picasso and our OG Kush strain, these will be very impactful strains in the marketplace when it comes to the connoisseur sector. My partner Camp is very talented, very good with systems, help build all these environmental conditions that we want, very good at breeding as well and selecting the genetics. We're really trying to set a standard here for the industry that this is good for everybody, that this is the right choice. This is one of our workshop rooms with the guys. It's about an eight-man team of guys that are here constantly maintaining and working on the building. We have one of the best teams of people that uh, I could ever dream of. Like, I really feel like teams, they win championships. When you build a really good team, you can win a championship. And that's what I think we have here as a championship team. But once you get a facility, it's still not done. Right, yeah, so we've had we've had to dedicate a flower room just to getting everything perfect in all of the other rooms. Once everything's perfect in the other rooms, this will shrink down and go back to growing. I think maybe we should show them some dry flower now. That's good. So all these are dry rooms and bedrooms on this inner side. All the outer edges are our bloom rooms. We're gonna go to the second floor where our trim room is right now. And there should be about 30, 40 people in there trimming dry cannabis right now. It's a beautiful sight to see in this legal market. Something I've always dreamt of being able to do. It was a really uh, strange occasion when you finally set into you that this is such a, a sophisticated operation. Should we take flower. the elevator? Sure. We all have one goal, and it is to, to win and succeed in this business model. When you get a bunch of people aligned with the right interests, you can do amazing things. It's a lot of fun working with your friends. That's the best part. In here is our trim space for our trim crew. Plants come in here and they process them in this section first into these types of trays here. Once they get done processing these trays, they bring them into there for the rest of the trimmers to trim. So everybody has their own station. They have their trays they're working on there, untrim stuff. They put their finished product in here. And everybody here is just, like they're really good people. We just found some of, I feel like, the best people that Long Beach has to offer have gravitated to our building. And I feel just lucky to have this community here. They weigh the tray going in and then they weigh the tray coming back out so that they have the same weight so that we know sort of what we're producing and, and ensuring that everything is in compliance with what the regulations are looking for. Then from here, we'll go into our packaging space. Oh, wait. So, we're good. Right now, is working on the Beyond Blueberry string. 
We'll load the machine with jars here. We'll load the cannabis up top on this automated yeah. scale here that will weigh out the 3.5 grams of an eighth and put it into this jar here. It'll run down the line. They will make it their way here where the caps come down here, passing the jar down to here, into the next section where it gets induction sealed and then it'll go into the, the boxes there and they will finish putting the stickers on there as well. These are all the compliancy stickers that have to go on every box. It has the testing, the harvest date, the cannabinoids, the percentage of THC. This is what's good about regulated cannabis. People actually get to see what they're getting, the guesswork, and the lack of knowledge of how things are created is, is taken out when you put this regulation in, in process. The best part about it is the, the testing for pesticides. No more people spraying their plants with poisons and, and sneaking it in there and no one knowing. This is what it's all about with legal cannabis is clean, regulated cannabis that people actually know what they're getting and it's, it's no longer just this mystery of where it came from. It makes me very proud. How was it, Robbie? So, I mean, we had the absolute pleasure of visiting a grow room that's going to be an example for the entire U.S., not the, you know, the world. <laughs> the regulations and all the processes that have to go through. I mean, look at us. <laughs> Booties, full suits, that's how you keep things clean. Everybody meet Ronnie, who? a young black suburbanite. Grew up with the white since he learned to read and write. He's only 10 and pretends to fit in because the little white homie got him thinking he's as white as them. He has a pop to own stocks in Xerox. Pop's only problem was the bourbon and peace. Not hey, uh, my name is Stefan. I'm with uh, Seabright Distribution. And I'm from San Pedro, California. That's what's up. Well, um, shoot, I've been in the cannabis industry since the dime bags, <laughs> for real. Um, and, uh, you know, that's what got me here, actually. I've been, you know, uh, I've been around it since the early 80s when, uh, you know, when, they, uh, when it was sold in dime bags and whatnot. And uh, I transcended into um, making products. I, um, I have a, a buddy, a, a homie of mine named uh, Vision. Uh, he's actually blind and he has uh, one carat diamonds in each of his eyes. He had his own company, which was called Budhead. And, uh, and he's a real hustler, so I started getting with him. He's, he showed me how to make gum. We were making gum, we were making sodas, we were making anything that had to do with uh, cannabis. We were, we, that's what we were doing. Then from there, I went to, uh, I was working with another one of my buddies, um, a buddy named Harold, uh, Floss P, shout out. We started doing uh, Kushtown sodas, so uh, I was doing the Kushtown sodas for umpteen years, and then over there I was doing hot sauce, uh, barbecue sauce, gum, you name it. Anything I could infuse cannabis with, we were getting money with. Then from there, I was of course all this time I'm still, you know, I'm doing an entertainment thing. I actually had an, uh, a, uh, you know, and I come from. I come from, be, I was a choreographer, my bad, you know, this cannabis working on your boy. I, I was a choreographer. I started out a choreographer. That's how I left San Pedro. I started out a choreographer, started dancing for Breeze, L.A. Posse. Um, from there, I got a few commercials. I, you know, I was a part of the Bobby Ball agency. They uh, transcended my career into acting and commercials. Um, I'm in the movie uh, Robin Hood Men in Tights, the, uh, the rapper in the forest with the glasses on, that's your boy. So I went from there doing that to Dharma and Greg, Home Improvement, Martial Law. I've been blessed with a decent, you know, IMDB. And then, uh, but all the while doing my cannabis thing because you know, the acting thing is like this. But I also was blessed with a, uh, I had a record deal. I was signed to Ruthless. I was signed to uh, Easy. So of course I was around cannabis during them days, you dig? So I had a, uh, a record out over there, Stefan, you know, under my real name. So I did the uh, Ruthless Record thing at the, all the while, you know, doing my cannabis movement. And uh, eventually 
I landed at um, Corrupt's Moon Rock. I was a, a salesperson for Corrupt's Moon Rock, and uh, and then tr uh, Corrupt's uh, turned into Doctor Zodiacs, and then I was a uh, salesperson at uh, Doctor Zodiacs. You know, like the territory sales manager, and. Uh, um, Brad, who's you know who runs the place, you know, which is uh, Zodiac Step Pops, was like a mentor to me. You know, he taught me a lot more about a lot more. Check me out. <laughs> he, he taught me more things about uh, the business side of the cannabis movement. You know, the uh, sales structure where I don't come from cubicle sales or boiler room sales. So this language was a new language that I had to learn and whatnot. So he. Uh, he taught me that language and uh, took me under his wing and uh, I was at uh, Zodiac's for about five and a half years. And then uh, once Zodiac got their license with um, Seabright, I became the territory sales manager at Seabright, which that's what I do now, but I'm also the creative director at Seabright. So um, at Seabright, they, they gave me the opportunity to create brands, to uh, you know, help with marketing, allow me, you know, I got a decent squad, you know, I got a decent marketing team, you know, from, from the art to the vocals, to writing, to management, to everything, because at Seabright, at Seabright, uh, let me get some of this uh, hammerhead water, you know, hammerheads need water. <laughs> Seabright is also Seabright Farms, which is a distribution, it's a grow, it's a one-stop shop, particular spot we do manufacturing we do distribution we're passed through um it's it's like the 7-eleven of the cannabis game except from the bat it's been a um set up to uh to give back to the community because we're based in long beach from day one uh adam he's a uh, he's what we call uh, you know our a our corporate hippie you know what I'm saying? So he makes sure that um, we're coming from a place of, you know, giving back, love, community, things like that. He makes sure that the the uh, corporate and the uh, and the community find a nice balance. You dig what I'm saying? So uh, with our owner, uh, John, you know, he speaks that language, too. He's a uh, harbor area. So he speaks that language and understands community, but also he understands the community, uh, the cannabis industry and what the cannabis industry needs. So that's how I've been blessed to get, you know, my position in this play, real talk. I mean, cause other folks aren't given the chance that I've been given, you know what I'm saying? I'm from Pedro, you dig what I'm saying? So for, you know, cause it's been like a separation. It's where the, uh, where the folks that think they know because they got dough, they think they know what it is. That's why the game is kind of funky and a lot of y'all is struggling. The facts is you came in with a lot of techies. You came in with the corporate dough, but you forgot about the people. You get hit with the, oh, uh, well, see, this is the demographic we want to reach. And then I frown up and they're looking at me like, this guy don't know what he's talking about. But there is no demographic when it comes to cannabis. You dig? I mean, it's a community. What's the demographic? I, I smoke with short people, tall people. I smoke with white, black. I smoke with different religions. Come on, man. It's a, it's a that is the community. That's the demographic. Cannabis is the demographic. Real talk. Oh, wow. I mean, one was the um, the misunderstanding that the shops have. OK, look, this, you know, OK, this is just how I view it. The traditional side was was hustling and, and and folks was make they were making money so in a, in a hustle side everything is double up it has to be double this it has to be double that so now once the once they made the transition over into to this side they still wanted that double but now they have a tax on top of that double so now they really hurting the people you feel you feel me they're really hurting the people so instead but not realizing that now we're in a we're in a uh, a legal business like uh, like a CVS, where you should have only like a 30% markup on your product. So that way you can, you know, so the people could participate and, it, and, you, and you won't be getting gouged. Cause everybody's like, I'm used to having my Lambo. You know, I'm used to balling. I was making 50, you know, if I can't get 50% on that, if I can't mark your shit up, I mean, 
if I can't mark your stuff up double than what you're selling at wholesale, then I don't want it. No, we need to, you need to go back to the class, be blessed that you got a license and that you're in this legal community. Now what we do is we understand that just a markup enough on you so you can make you a little bit of profit because you and 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 be able to keep on um, participating and pay your staff and this way the community will be will run but y'all keep doubling up and gouging and and demanding all this this is why you got a store full of shit that you can't sell real talk mm. Okay, what I'm smoking on here is a hammerhead infused pre-roll. This would happen to be my uh, vanilla mango, you know what I'm saying? Quality cannabis, natural terpenes, you know, premium diamonds, yes. And, uh, you know, it has oil and keef coated. Uh, they're um, pretty strong, you dig? Yeah, real talk. So, too much of this, you know, <laughs> you might be feeling like a hammerhead. <laughs> real shit. <laughs> yeah. But, um, okay, at Seabright, as far as um, the compassionate side of the uh, community, what that is, is, um, is knowing that we can, we can provide quality products for a decent price. Because it seems like, you know, the whole community was supposed to be built around uh, medicine. You know, it's like they forgot about the medication of it. Like this is, this is still medicine, but y'all trying to get dollars. Y'all worse than Big Pharma. Real talk. So it's, uh, what it is is we know, and, and what we're doing is providing good quality cannabis, medication, things for enjoyment at a quality, at a, at a decent price, at an affordable price, especially until the shops get that understanding that you guys are dogging folks out and I'm not gonna say all the shops because I have been to a few shops where they get that understanding and when they say that they're like okay how much you selling it for and I say ten dollars and they say okay well uh, okay we you know so we'll sell them for 13 and I'm shocked as hell I'm like what what'd you say 13 13 plus tax that's what I'm talking about come on man this is what I'm talking about we're not in I'm not here to say buy my shit so that we can win period yeah this this is where I'm at, but I'm not saying that. This is across the community. Everybody needs to think like that. Everybody can win, you know what I'm saying? On both sides, you can win, you can pay your bills. The, me the folks that need the medicine can get the medicine and they can feel good. Stop doing that, <laughs> real tough. Well, when I was younger, cannabis meant, you know, get high. If I had the good stuff, break the ice, you know, I can get in, talk to a nice lady if I had some decent. But uh, at this point, <clears throat> It means community. It means being able to help out because now I'm, you know, like, you know, money is definitely a tool. I use, a, use that tool to be able to assist and, and help out, build and things like that. So that's what cannabis means to me. It means from, a, you know, I can, grow three, I can grow things from something that grows. You dig what I'm saying? This grows, I can grow communities, I can grow activities, I can grow learning, I can grow all kind of things, man. Come on, I can grow thought, I can grow it all from this plant. And that's what I'm doing. That's what we're doing at Seabright. You dig? Real talk, we're using it for that, you know? My kids get to go to better schools, things like that, you feel me? It's not, it's not all about the money, real shit, it's not that. Real, I mean, you know, I, I break out one of these with a stranger and uh, we're no longer strangers, you dig? That's real. Well, I, I've always been open with my cannabis use. So, you know, cause in the, uh, in the music community, my production name is Roach Killer. And I got that name from Easy. That's from smoking the roaches down real small, you dig? So me, uh, me Easy and uh, Faze on Love, you know, Faze on Love, the comedian, we'd smoke, we'd be smoking and uh, it would get down about that far. To me, that's wasting. And, and Easy would say, give it to the roach killer. Done deal. Real talk. <laughs> yeah, but uh, it, it's funny because I have a family member. You know, I mean, like I said, I've been involved in this for a while. You know, I had to sit down for a while behind things like this. And, uh, and, and, and the family thought that I should have been doing other things. But now the family wants to invest it's people that I know want to invest. They all know that, you know, Steph knows it. <laughs> you know, he's been doing it all, real shoot, since it uh, transformed into what it is, Steph knows it. 
He knows it. And, and it's not just know it from smoking it. I know I've been blessed to, man, come on, I've been at it so long. I know about the smoking of it. I know about how, what, the, what it does for the people. And I know what it does for corporate. Real talk, so let's get it. What's your favorite thing about cannabis? My favorite thing about cannabis is, I love laughing. You mean, I mean, I love, uh, I mean, not too many people could say, when was the last time you had one of them laughs that were all this hurt, where you nearly piss on your stuff? So, I mean, on your, <laughs> real shit. Good, good. Real talk, I love laughing. I laugh regardless without this, but I laugh even more on this. I want to laugh on this. So for some reason, only the energy, it, 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 it brings the energy around me, which brings laughter, good vibes is what that is. So that's what it is to me. Um, Ooh, set your cell phone fire. Drop ashes on me. Ah, I said set my cell phone fire. <laughs> oh, well, where I see it going, it's here. It's, it's, it's a wrap. They took the lid off of it. It'll soon be federal because, uh, you know, with the whole uh, folks were tripping on uh, the fact that cannabis was, uh, cannabis workers were essential to uh, to what was going on, they, and they just thought it was okay. Why why should you be able to smoke weed, unknowing that we pay taxes here? So when you guys were sitting at the house buying weed, we were still paying taxes to the government. They were still getting money from this community. Real talk. So that, that's why it's essential. And it helps. I mean, you would hate to be home stressed and, and can't hit something. So come on now, stop that. Uh, I smoke blunts. <laughs> yeah, I smoke blunts. Uh, I know I don't, I shouldn't, I shouldn't smoke blunts. You know, I don't really like all the, all the flavors and stuff like that. I like close to natural, but I've been also smoking the frontals, you know, the big natural leaf, you know, I tear my own, roll my own on some you know, Rasta fire and shit, real talk. Shout out to the Rastas. Um, yeah, I roll my own. Um, I don't mind smoking a joint. I'm not really a bong smoker. I mean, because to me, every different way is a different high for me. You know, I've been smoking that long that I can tell. Real shit, just like how they change a lot of flavor in food and shit. I hate that shit. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm that classic that I'm like, oh, I remember when it had real sugar in it <laughs> and it tastes like this. So I'm the same with the weed, you know what I'm saying? Real shit. Cause I know uh, it's, a, it's changed a lot. You know, like the percentages have gotten stronger, but it doesn't seem stronger to me. I mean, like, back, you remember, okay, well back in the day, how you, how you could tell if the joint was fire off the bat, you get to looking at the zigzag. If it had some brown on it, you already knew it had, it had that tar in it. You'd have tar all on your lips and stuff like that. You don't even get that from the, I mean, whew, I ain't gonna say no names, but, cause then they gonna say, oh, you disillusioned. But it's a lot of strong stuff out there that you don't get to tar no more. And, and I don't know what that's about. So, cause, because I'm not into the scientific side of it, but I enjoy it, you know. That's a new language that I'm learning to speak. You know, it's like uh, Rosetta Stone. So I got the Rosetta Stone for cannabis and uh, corporate. So I've been learning that language to go both ways. So I'm here for you, real talk. Like I said earlier about uh, cannabis being able to uh, break ice and make friends and stuff like that, but also that creative aspect. You know, it makes you creative. I wrote my entire album on some weed, plus easy. Like there's a book out by, um, oh my God, that's whack. Uh, oh, that's whack. Ben Westoff. Ah, yeah, by Ben Westoff about uh, West Coast gangster rap. Your boy's in it, and it talks and it and explains how when I got my deal from Easy, he gave me a kitchen bag. You know, one of the shopping bags you get from Ralph's. He gave me one of them full of weed, and like fifteen hundred dollars, and said, "Go to the studio and work on your album." So we definitely play. I mean, cannabis. <laughs> cannabis definitely plays a major part in the music game. I don't know how for everybody, honestly, because everybody don't smoke. You know, they do their own thing. It's a new day. Well, I mean, it's crazy because you see how it breaks down. I think what it is is it starts to make you focus more on what it is that you're doing because I, you don't want to shop 
when you high, that's the messed up shit. You fuck around and buy some shoes too big <laughs> that don't really fit or some shit that you don't want because of the feeling. You know, you, it's more of a it's more of a feeling type of thing. Real shit. Like I remember the first time uh, I was trying to get uh, that Prince cut on my mustache and I was, you know, I had a little buzz going. Mm, mm, got it close and boom. <laughs> that was the worst. <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying? So it helps you focus, you know what I'm saying? But it, it, it can't take you, over the, it can take you over the focus, real shit. Because if you focus too hard on a mix, you can ruin a mix. Come on now. You focus too hard on where that snare should be, you keep going, no, I think it's, no, it's too loud. No, 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 no. And then when you do finally listen to it later, it's, bah, it's bah, banging in your ear, man. Okay, I, I like sativa. I've all, you know, I like sativa because of the taste. I like the, I like that sweet taste, and and more uh, sativas have a sweet smell, whereas indicas, they have an offensive smell, like so strong you'd be like, ooh, like to to cannabis smokers, it's like, ooh, that's fire. But to people who don't smoke, are super offended off the indica, <laughs> but they'll smell that sativa and go. What is that? You know, real talk. So I'm a sativa smoker. I like it because I'm a thinker and I like to be in thought. And that's where that has me. And I clean up, I cook, you know, I'm one of them dudes, you know. I like to cook, I sizzle, I burn. Real talk. <laughs> uh, being a Canada dad, well, shoot, I'm, I'm great. <laughs> I'm great, I'm a, I'm a Canada granddad. Yeah, you know, I just look like this. <laughs> I use a lot of cannabis infused products. Uh, no, no, real talk. I'm a cannabis grandfather. You know, my, my granddaughter is one years old. And uh, yeah, I have, uh, I have five children, one son and four beautiful daughters. That's what's happening. And they know their father is in the cannabis industry. They know their father smokes cannabis. And it's crazy because they don't. My son does, he's 26 years old. But my daughters, no, they don't. Real talk. D Daddy been wearing these for a while and they know that. So my, my, I have a 13 year old and a five year old and they, and when they first asked about these, I say, these daddy's healing stones. No lie. Straight up. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. Cause I mean, my, my mother smoked when I was little and uh, my dad didn't like that, you know, not at all. Cause they were separated and my, <laughs> my dad, he stuttered. Right. And when my dad would pick us up, First thing he asked when, when we get in the car, he said, your mom, mama's still smoking them weeds? <laughs> and I would always say, nah, she knows she not. And my brother would say, yeah, she got a, she got a box full of seeds under her bed. <laughs> so it's been in my life a long time, real talk. My, and, and I love my mom, my mother's still alive. She's, uh, she's known that I've been smoking cannabis for a long time. She hasn't, um, but she also sees that I'm productive, so she's never came at me like, that's messing your life up or anything like that. She's like, baby, you doing your thing. I'm proud of you. You know, my mom's never been that type of, she's never been like judgmental towards whatever I was doing. You dig what I'm saying? Real talk. If I was doing stuff in the street, she made me better in the streets. That's just who she was, real talk. So, um, you know, because she was a young mother, so we were close in age. So at times people thought she was my sister because she act like my sister, my mom in the street, I'll be at a party and all of a sudden somebody say, hey, there go your mom. I'll be like, oh man, let's go. And be like, no, we having a good time. My mom, hey, she hit the party because we close in age. So we'll be at a barbecue together, you dig? So it's been a blessing, real talk. So talk to your children, real stuff. It ain't about, it ain't like they don't know, but speak with your children. I mean, they're your children. Why would you have somebody else do the talking for you? Come on now. Where I want to see the future of cannabis is, I want to see it, I, I definitely want to see, I want to see, uh, well, corporate, that's some old other shit, you know, but what corporate can bring to the game as far as the money to be able to hire the tech guys to be able to do the science, to be able to make it more of a medical situation, I'm not mad at that. But for you weirdos that's coming in with money and you tech guys with no cannabis vibe, you one year smoking, I'm not mad at you one year smokers, but I'm saying you one year smoker cannabis company runners thinking y'all know what time it is. Uh, like they say, you know, if you, if you don't know, get somebody who know, man. 
That's how you do that. It's, it's a lot of people out here who know. It's a lot of people who, who could use the money, could use the help, and they'll help you out. But you, you, you have to listen. You, you can't shut your ears off because you got a dollar. All of a sudden, you, your ears don't listen to somebody that don't have a dollar. And I've been through that throughout the game. Not saying that I know everything, but it was a lot of things that I did know and the money didn't want to hear you because you don't have money. Because they figure, well, if, if that was right, you'd have money yourself. Knowing damn well you, did, you didn't get your money from this. So shut that up. Real talk, just take the time to listen. Real talk. And, and, and you may just get more money if that's what you're here for. But we hope that that's not what you're here for. We hope that you're here for the community. And from being here with the community, you will make some money to be able to help the community. And if we can get us a nice cannabis circle going on. Real talk. Other than that, y'all weirdos and y'all going to keep losing. Y'all going to keep losing. <laughs> Thinking that the money and just, oh, we'll blow out the advertisement and we'll just hit them over the head with our, uh, so stop it. The people is where it at. Once you leave us, and, and I mean, when I say the people, I mean the cannabis community, all shapes, sizes, colors, creeds, and religions. You dig what I'm saying? Real talk from the veterans too, you know what I'm saying? Because that's a medicine to the veterans. Shout out to my veterans. Real talk, that's a medicine for them, and I know that. So that's what we're doing at Seabright. We're making strong medicine for the community at a decent price, and, and the rest of y'all need to be doing the same. And if y'all need to holler at me, and, and, and we could chop it up to, to, to strengthen the community. Holla at your boy, I'm not tripping. Let's get something going. Community, cannabis, LBCA, shout out. Your boy, Stefan, we gonna be here for the long haul. See how see bright distribution. And these hammerheads at your local, uh, you know, delivery. Hit them up, tell them, call them up, they got them. <laughs> hey, all right, I had a blast. It's your boy Stefan in there smoking on a hammerhead infused pre-roll at your local dispensary or delivery service. Brought to you by Seabright Farms. Yes, uh, you, can, uh, you can find Seabright Farms at seabrightfarms.com. Uh, you can hit your boy up at Roach Killer Music on um, Instagram. And, uh, and we we'll also have an Instagram for our uh, pre-rolls, which is hammerhead underscore pre-rolls. And uh, we'd like to see you out there. And we have a, um, a lot of exciting things coming. And we'll see you in the community. We love you. Tune in. Yada, dick.